Hello, everyone. Welcome. You are joining Quiet Light's monthly webinar series. Uh, and this is the month of April, or if you're recording, watching a recording later, it can be whatever month you want. Uh, and this is Essential Accounting Steps to Prepare Your Amazon FBA Business for Sale. And I'm joined by Ethan Alexander and Jeff Guilano. So just to set expectations right up top, what are you going to walk away with today? We're going to talk about the definition of accounting and some of the key aspects of uh, p &Ls, cash versus accrual, all that good stuff, some nitty gritty. Uh, we're going to talk about how the state of accounting can change your sale or your exit for the better or maybe the worse. Maybe some stories will come out, um, but hopefully we can all learn from them. Uh, and we'll be answering any and all of your questions. So down at the below, um, at the bottom of your Zoom box, you'll see that Q&A chat box at any point starting right now. If you have any questions, you can put them in there and I will make sure that we get them answered. Okay, so quick background on Quiet Life for anyone who may not be familiar. We are entrepreneur led and we help entrepreneurs buy, build and sell their online business. And so by entrepreneur led, I mean all of our advisors, our entrepreneurs have bought, built or sold a company or multiple companies um, for themselves. So they absolutely understand this entire process and how it feels to be in it. Um, we also do a lot of educational work. So webinars, just like this, we have podcasts, blogs, articles, uh, we have all sorts of free guides you can download on our website. So if you're looking for more content after this, you can go over to quietlight.com and there are tons of resources at your fingertips. Okay, we'll get into the good stuff. Quick intros. So Ethan Alexander, welcome. Ethan is an entrepreneur and an advisor at Quiet Light. He has built numerous multi-million dollar businesses. Uh, he has sold and acquired a number of companies, one of which appeared on Shark Tank, which is very cool. Uh, he has served as a broker for both the buyers and the sellers. So he especially has that very unique insight into the process on both sides and what everyone coming to the table is looking for, um, for a successful deal. Uh, he lives in San Diego. So when he's not doing entrepreneur things, he's at the beach or finding the best taco shops. Uh, and he likes to stay active hiking and playing sports and traveling. So welcome, Ethan. Well, hey, Sam. Thanks so much. No problem. Uh, and then Jeff, we are joined by a very special guest, Jeff Guilano. So Jeff is the head of marketing at A2X. Uh, he led the marketing team at HubDoc until it was eventually acquired by Zero in 2018 for 70 million USD. I say that because Jeff is from Canada. Um, and so he recently moved to farm country from Toronto, Ontario, and he spends a lot of time chasing his two daughters who are under two years old. And he has been a part of both successful and failed acquisitions. So he deeply understands the importance uh, of solid financials. So we'll probably get into some of that today. Jeff, I hope it's not too triggering for you, but welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, really looking forward to chatting with, uh, with you and Ethan. Great. Uh, so one more quick reminder, if you have any questions at any time, that Q&A chat box will be here the entire hour. So feel free to put them into there. Um, okay, just to kick us off, um, Ethan, I'll start with you just really quickly, a background on how you got into the entrepreneur world and on an e-commerce, FBA, et cetera. Uh, what, what, what brings you here? <laughs> yeah, why am I here? So, so I was working corporate in my past life. I was actually an engineer, surprise, surprise. And I learned it wasn't for me. So I was like, what, what else am I going to do? And so that kind of led me to stumbling into the e-com space. And so from that, was able to build and eventually sell a company, started up another company in the space, sold that. Uh, started up a real estate investment company, which I still run down here in San Diego. And then from that time, I've also acquired a couple other companies. So I kind of have a business problem, but <laughs> but good news is like during that entire time, I've been picking up di different accounting practices for the different industries. Um, so I've been learning this slowly over time. It's definitely not, you know, I learned it all in a night. It's kind of, you know, learn by doing, learn from experience. So that's that's really where my accounting background has come from. Um, I, I like numbers. And so like, it's, it's actually a subject matter that I like talking about and can dive into it. I know not everyone likes that. So, uh, as, as Sam mentioned, if, if you guys have any questions, like feel free to, to, uh, put them in because I'm, I'm more than happy to kind of go through things, or if we need to slow down or revisit past topics that we'll talk about, like always happy to kind of cover what's needed so that we make sure our, our fundamentals are there. But, uh, yeah, so that's a quick, quick little background on, on my numbers game. Awesome. So Jeff, what, what brings you to the numbers game? <laughs> My story isn't as interesting as Ethan's. I was never on Shark Tank, <laughs> unfortunately. 
Uh, I've never run an, an online e-commerce business, online e-commerce, uh, oxymoron. Um, and, and I'm not an accountant or bookkeeper by trade, but uh, for a little over the last five years, I have been working with thousands um, of accountants and bookkeepers and by extension, their clients and in large part e-commerce clients uh, building um, accounting software to help service their needs. So I've, I've been the head of marketing that was mentioned at a company called HubDoc, uh, which was acquired eventually by Zero. Zero, uh, for those of you that don't know, is the second largest uh, cloud accounting platform in the world, right behind QuickBooks, which I'm sure is, is a name that everybody here knows. Um, and then uh, from there, I, I kind of co-founded and uh, joined a company called Field Chat, head of marketing that's unfortunately one of the failed acquisitions we can talk about that a little <laughs> bit later and a lot of that was due to accounting so um it is quite an, in an interesting story and then most recently i uh, i joined a company called a2x so back in the cloud accounting space uh and a2x uh, is a cloud accounting application that supports e-commerce sellers specifically as well as their accountants and bookkeepers and where we help is automate a large part of um, the revenue reconciliation side of things. So breaking down those Amazon and those Shopify payouts, uh, especially if you're using QuickBooks or Xero, into kind of like all of those independent transactions that help you get a better view of the, your business. Um, and that's likely where we're gonna spend a lot of time here, not necessarily on the A2X side, but the importance of actually understanding uh, what these net deposits are made out of to help kind of get better visibility into your into your business, into your financials, and set, set you up for success as you start to consider or, or move towards uh, the sell of your online business. Well, that was a good segue. Speaking of setting up for success, let's set up everyone tuning in for success. Maybe we can start with some definitions that we're going to be talking about, key accounting terms, um, what are some of the things we're going to be throwing around today that people need to know. Yeah, I can I can start with kind of the core and then and then segue um, into Ethan so that you could talk about kind of like the the tactical use of these uh, accounting methods. But um, I think one of the things that we're going to talk about quite a bit is the difference between cash base and, and accrual accounting. Most of the businesses that we see come into our door um, are actually uh, utilizing the cash based accounting method. And they're on their journey to transitioning to accrual accounting. Now, what does cash and accrual accounting mean? Um, well, strictly speaking, it's actually just kind of like a, a, a timing difference. Yeah. So with cash accounting, uh, you're recording the transaction, whether it's income or an expense, the moment that cash trades hands. So for example, if, if I buy something um, from X vendor, uh, but I only have to pay in a month from now, well, I'm only actually recording that transaction a month when the cash leaves my bank account. And conversely, if I'm providing a service uh, to a business and um, I send them an invoice, um, I'm actually only recording the income the second that I actually get that money in my bank account. So cash accounting is, is a useful tool and a very simple accounting method for folks uh, that have smaller, non-complicated business uh, businesses. And usually it's not really well suited towards e-commerce where you're talking about like a really high volume of transactions, inventory purchases, bunch of different uh, types of payables, uh, staff, so on and so forth. And then on the flip side, accrual accounting, if we're looking at it from a timing perspective, um, it's, it's at the moment that either the income or the expense has been incurred. So if you look at the same examples that I used previously, if I'm providing kind of a service uh, to you and, and um, I send you an invoice, but the terms are 30 days and you pay me in 30 days, I actually don't count it in the 30 days. I, I count it from the moment that I've provided the services and I've sent you the invoice. Uh, and the same thing conversely on an expense. So for example, if I have a bill that's incoming with the cash accounting method, I only count that transaction the second that the money comes out of my account. Um, on the accrual side of things, I count it the second that I get the bill, whether I'm paying you know, in 30 days or 60 days. It just gives me much better view of what's actually happening in my business, especially when you bake in um, categories like 
uh, inventory, like uh, just kind of the sheer volume of, of revenue that you're generating from your multiple sales channels, so on and so forth. So those are kind of the core principles, cash accounting versus accrual. And, and you know, the oversimplified way to look at it is it's, it's really just kind of like a timing method. Cash moment that the transactions, uh, or sorry, the cash trades hands, accrual, it's a second that either the expense or, 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 or the income is incurred. So that's probably like the two core things. They translate really well into what Ethan is going to talk about, which is uh, you know P and L uh, as kind of like one of the core uh, types of documents that help inform um, a transaction uh, in in the sale of your business. Yeah. So so why does this matter? <laughs> so at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, it completely changes valuation. So I've seen companies that I've worked with it be on a cash basis accounting. And when we switch over to accrual, it, it may change the valuation by a, a, a large factor, two, five, 10 times. Like I've seen some huge changes where we go from, hey, maybe we, you know, this doesn't make sense to sell to, oh, your company's actually worth a million dollars. Like, who knew? And so, so obviously that's kind of the big impact here on, on why this matters. And so there's a lot of nuances between cash and accrual based accounting, but I want to focus specifically on uh, the two main PL items that it actually affects most of the time, which is going to be the sales, which Jeff was, was talking to, and then as well as the COGS, the cost of goods sold. And so the biggest one, the, the most, um, the, the biggest, or I guess, issue that I'll see with PLs is, is on the COGS specifically. Because it is really easy, just like Jeff was mentioning, to record when you're paying vendors, you know, when you're buying all those supply materials for a physical product e-com company at the time of purchase, because that matches up with your bank statement. So it's really easy to see, oh, I sent that vendor $25,000 for that purchase order. I sent that yesterday. I'm going to report it in April. It's, it's really easy to do that if you're doing your own accounting. But what should happen on the COG side, instead of recording those COGs as, as when you pay to cash, it's actually when the product is sold. And so therefore your sales and COGS are, are gonna be really reflective of each other. Meaning when sales go up, COGS go up. When sales go down, COGS go down. And so when you have large purchase orders, so like a lot of companies have big Q4s. So they're prepping usually in the summer or, or early fall for some of these large purchase orders. And you'll see a lot of cash go out and if your, your books are on a cash basis, you'll see some pretty heavy negative numbers most months kind of during those timelines, where in the fact, you're still running a profitable company. And so reason why that this kind of changes valuation is that you're, you don't have that cash drain that I was talking about in showing negative months. You're actually showing profitable months on the book when, you're, when you make that switch from, from cash basis over to accrual basis. And so from that, um, the books actually look better numbers wise, the trends actually look better. The fact that you're buying inventory doesn't negatively affect you. So inventory is normally an investment in your company. So you shouldn't be negatively affected uh, when purchasing that inventory, especially on evaluation when you're looking to sell. And so good news is when you convert it to accrual, it doesn't. And so um, that's kind of a the big aha moment as far as is why this is important you know, why it's, it's good to, to uh, make that transition. And if you have, I guess, an easy way to make this transition is if you know your landed cost of goods sold. So landed cost of goods sold is going to be the price you pay for the product with the supplier, plus whatever shipping tariffs it costs to get over to a 3PL or Amazon FBA warehouse. That's what we call landed cost of goods sold. And so that shipping cost plus the actual product cost, if we know that on a per SKU basis and we know how many SKUs, how many units of a SKU we sell in a month, we can just multiply those numbers for each SKU. And that basically gives us our COGS on a cruel basis. So good news is if you know what your costs are on a unit basis, it's pretty easy to kind of figure out, okay, what's my actual accrual basis COGS accounting look like? So I know it's a lot of fancy terms, but it's actually, once you dive into the, to the metrics on how to make that transition occur, it's actually not that bad. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, Ethan, as you were kind of going through that, one of the oversimplified analogies that I really love uh, around the, the difference between cash and accrual accounting is it's kind of like you're preparing to run for a race and you're, and you're training for it and you know what your goal and your objective is. 
uh, with accrual accounting, kind of you know how you're improving month over month, and then you could like look at this as training period over training period to know how you're likely going to get to that objective to you run the race the shortest amount of time. With cash based accounting, you kind of you see you see your bank statement and you can see the revenue going up, and you like you know you're getting faster because the number is you know is getting higher every single month, but you kind of you don't really know how you're improving month over month and how you're going to be ready to achieve kind of the objective that you set out from the beginning. Uh, whereas with accrual, like it's, it's, it's almost as simple as like, Hey, I, I now have a timer. And I know that every time I'm, I'm running this hundred meter dash, I know how I'm progressing against my objective, uh, oversimplified analogy, but I, I think, I think it, it paints a really good picture about, you know, why this is important and how it helps businesses grow and why it helps, um, then set them set themselves up for success when when they start to evaluate um, selling a business. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and like on a physical product ecom type business, is that especially for a growing business, the inventory is a cash suck. Like yeah. you you basically make all your profit and you throw it back in inventory and you keep doing that and building this bigger and bigger business. I mean, that's why when you sell, most owners recapture or at least get the biggest payout from the business at that period in time because they're putting so much back in the inventory. So on a cash basis, it looks like, you know, you're not doing so hot, but to exactly your point, Jeff, it's like on an accrual basis, you're actually doing well, the money's just going into inventory. So you shouldn't be yeah. negatively affected for investing in the future success of your business. And so pretty much if you have a growing business, pretty much in all cases, switching over from cash to accrual basis will always lead to a higher valuation because of a higher bottom line specifically. So it's not to say that cash is wrong. It's just not necessarily optimal, um, especially if you're thinking about an exit. Well, well, cash is super important from the standpoint of analyzing your cash flow and knowing how much money you have in the bank and knowing, hey, can I afford this growth rate? Because sometimes businesses are growing so fast that you may not have the, the cash on the sidelines to be able to fund that growth. You may have to start looking to outside capital or slowing down that growth rate. So it's it serves a different purpose. It serves a very important purpose being on the cash basis, because if you run out of money, you can't magically make it appear somewhere. You got to get it from somewhere. And so from that standpoint, yes, it is very important. Um, from an operation standpoint, from an owner perspective, but uh, it plays a very different role when we start talking about valuations, what you can sell the company for. So um, they, they both are necessary. They both are needed. They just serve different purposes. Totally. And one thing that's important to note, like if you're not working with an outsourced bookkeeper um, to do your accrual accounting uh, on, a, on a month over month basis, and let's say you send everything over to your CPA at the end of the year, high likelihood that he's going to do everything in cash and submit your taxes in cash, right? So there's there's definitely still utility in it. Um, it's just the, Ethan, the, the difference to your point is the impact that it has on valuation. And then also just because you're, you're moving towards accrual doesn't mean that you shouldn't be reviewing your cash flow reporting on a relatively consistent basis to just kind of understand um, understand your position in that area. So like what I personally do from, from a business perspective as a business owner, like I'll use cash basis accounting for, for cash flow management and like projections of cash flow management. So I, I'm always projecting, you know, at least a few months out, if not six plus months out of, hey, where is my cash going to be allocated? Where is everything going? You know, what's coming in? What's going out the door? So that's, that's personally what I use the you know, cash type basis accounting for. And on the accrual side, I'll, it's basically like a metric check of what Jeff was saying, kind of comparing month over month. Hey, are our gross margins looking good? Are our net margins looking good? What's our marketing spend as a percentage of revenue? Because it basically normalizes the data from that perspective so that you can compare different time periods together. And it really gives you like an overall health check on the company. So like, like an Apple Watch, you know, tells you, you know, <laughs> how, how your exercises are. The accrual-based accounting, same thing. It gives you a normalization of data so that yeah. you can create dashboards and and look at metrics so that you can compare them and actually see okay in, in the long term you know if this continues if this trend continues like you know if this growth rate continues or if these margin decreases continue or these shipping cost increases continue you know can i survive that long term ethan, ethan i have a i have a question for you um because you really do have i think a, a pulse on the, on the fundamentals um here but did you do it yourself when you were running your businesses or did you outsource? <laughs> so so yes, yes and no. Work, so, right? 
so so when I started I sure did um just because I I liked it so I enjoyed it and it helped me learn an absolute ton um now I'll run with bookkeepers but as far as looking at the actual metrics reviewing those numbers um I I do that rather than rely on on somebody to tell me oh yep everything looks good so I think from like a bookkeeping perspective because I I know how it's done now and I understand it um I'm fine handing it off because because I'll I have a couple of checks in place too where I make sure that they're doing the right thing uh, from a bookkeeping side of things but I don't enjoy bookkeeping anymore I enjoy more of the financial analyst part of it got it yeah makes a ton of sense yeah, I think um, that's important to call out that you enjoy it. So that's why you <laughs> continue to do it. But not everyone who is running a business or is an entrepreneur is like, I love math. <laughs> um, right. And so outsourcing that can be something. So while we're on that topic, um, how would you rec do you recommend outsourcing? And I know, Jeff, obviously, automation is a big part of what you guys do. Um, how time saving can this be for people? Is it something that they should be fact checking like you do, Ethan, or how do you guys approach or think about both automation and outsourcing of your financials, which is obviously a hugely important part of someone's business? I, I, yeah, I, Jeff, I, you want to take this? Really, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll kind of go quick. Um, so, so for A2X, as an example, obviously we support with the automation of revenue reconciliation. Um, and, and the majority of what we do is build um, a technology to help do that for you. But we, in this conversation, I think people are starting to see that there's a lot more complexity involved than just kind of like, you know, throwing software into the mix and then hoping you can kind of get these beautiful outcomes at the end of the day that help you make more informed decisions about your business, give you better vis visibility. Like for us, I think the key is a combination of software and people. So we work with thousands of expert um, e-commerce accountants and bookkeepers that not only understand how to utilize the technology to get the most out of it, but to provide business owners with the data that they need to start to make more informed you know, financial analysis and, and, and by extension, decisions about their business. So when it comes to uh, automation and outsourced accounting and bookkeeping firms, we don't believe that it's an or, we actually look at it as, as an and. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I find it interesting, uh, Joe Valley, who is a, is a partner at Quiet Light, like I've listened to him on a few podcasts and he always like, <laughs> I, I just, I've, I've noticed that he has this kind of like saying that he always, always says, and he's like, you know, accounting sucks. Nobody cares about accounting, but it's really important that you do it well. And you know what, like you, you didn't get into the business to do accounting, uh, work with kind of an expert outsourced accountant and bookkeeper, um, not only uh, is it going to help kind of alleviate a lot of the stress and, 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 and give you better visibility into your business, but at the same time, it pays for itself back in, in multiples, especially if you're on a journey to selling your business, because it does help increase the, the valuation to have, you know, nice and tidy and, and, and clear financials. So on, on the automation and on the outsource question, um, the recommendation would be both. I know it feels like an expense, but one that pays for itself back over time as you continue to grow, not only in kind of like the visibility and the insights that it provides to help you kind of run a more successful business, but also for the topic of this conversation, which is, you know, the importance of accounting as you're on a journey to selling your business, like that's where it really comes into play and, and helps you get the most bang for your buck when actually selling your business. Yeah, I mean, Ethan, just curious, like of, of when, you know, you have um, entrepreneurs coming to you and saying like, I, I would like evaluation. Is there a percentage or how often are you seeing people that have great businesses, but it's like, okay, you can't sell right away because you actually have to go back and fix some of these accounting or P&L issues. Yeah, great question. So, so good news is I think because accounting has been preached so much the last couple of years is that more and more sellers that I run across have bookkeepers have those systems in place. And so good news is, is a lot of people have financials in order or most mostly in order where it just requires a few tweaks, but that's definitely not every case, especially, you know, if you're a new entrepreneur, like I know when I was starting back in the day, it's like, 
that wasn't a focus of mine. It's like, obviously you have, you have a sales problem problem first, you know, you have to figure out how to get sales, how to do marketing, how to actually fulfill on all these orders. And so like accounting isn't really a big deal until it is. And so, and so from that perspective, it's like, it's like if, if they're newer or if they've been running with, um, you know, just a CPA, not, not necessarily a bookkeeper. And so the CPA just does their taxes at the end of the year, then I can see, you know, some books issues there. And so really quickly, I want to define CPA and bookkeeper here. So bookkeeper is someone that will go ahead and go through all your transactions, typically monthly, and basically record them in whatever software that you use, QuickBooks, Zero, anything like that. Where a CPA, they more traditionally handle taxes. So at the end of the year, they'll take your books, basically put that all into the tax return, submit that to the IRS and, and your state and so basically those those are the big differences and so from my experience it's like most cpas aren't bookkeepers um, in the sense that bookkeepers have a specialty in being able to accurately record the data such that they're they're doing it right and on the e-com side it's like bookkeepers you know of course it depends on your size of business and everything but usually they'll range a couple hundred few hundred bucks a month type of deal so it's it's not a it's not a ginormous expense in regards to how much you're spending on accounting um, every year. You'll, you'll you'll spend a couple few grand uh, a year on on doing this type of bookkeeping. But um, hopefully that means you know with everything that you're doing right and potentially that information that your CPA can then use. It's like you know hopefully that means you're you're potentially saving yourself on taxes. Um, of course that's going to depend on your tax strategy, what you have going on, but usually it pays for itself. It definitely pays for yourself um, when when come time to sell and looking at at doing that because if your books have to redone be redone from scratch for years. Uh, we're talking, it's, it's, it's quite a bit, um, you know, potentially high four, low five figure type investment you got to pay to, to a bookkeeper CPA to redo those books. And so it's a big one-time expense if that does occur. So it's, it's these little things that you can do now to set yourself up for success later on down the line. Totally. I, you know, it's funny is you were talking about taxes and, and taxes fall, I'd say probably in one of the top three mistakes that we see. Um, e-commerce sellers make, especially those that aren't working with um, an outsourced uh, bookkeeping practice. But one, I mentioned it earlier, but the record um, those net payouts from, from their online sales channels as, uh, as income. And then the other is because they're not actually breaking out those deposits, they're actually recording um, tax as income as well, as opposed to a liability. And then that's where they kind of get hit a little bit at the end of the year. Um, in, 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 in getting kind of the right tax figures. Uh, so just that in and of, of itself, I think in a lot of ways pays for itself when you're working with an outsourced um, e-commerce uh, bookkeeper. And, and Sam, to give everyone just a visual, can you throw up slide five? Because I, I feel like that puts a good visual yeah. on exactly what we're talking about. And we don't have to go super in depth, but I, I want to highlight it for like 30 seconds to go over what Jeff was exactly talking about. Uh, to be able to paint that picture and, and kind of give a real use example here. Yes, I will do that right now. And while I bring that up, just true or false, it is never too late to fix accounting errors. Never too late. So, okay. so, <laughs> you know, I just want to make sure I, people know, aren't like scared. Yeah. Like, oh, no, oh, no, there's no, no, so you, much to you do. You don't have to be scared. No, it's like, it's all good news is normally because of like how we run everything these days online businesses. It's like the information's all there. We just got to collect it and put it in the right buckets. So good news is, it's like, yeah, we can do all this work and go through it and, and figure out who to work with to be able to make it happen. Um, so yeah, it's it's never too late is the good news. But right. oh, and thanks for throwing this up, Sam. Yeah. Yes, before you dive into it, um, we do have one question in the Q&A. We'll get to that right after this. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to continue to enter those. Um, we will get to them very, very soon. Sweet. Well, so this this is going back to exactly what Jeff was saying. So if we if we have a transaction, we see Amazon sent us a wire for eighty three thousand dollars. Basically, cool. We could throw that on our PL, you know, call it good for the month, and we move on. But that doesn't really tell us the full story. The full story is okay. There's there's a balance. There's actual sales, which is much larger than what we actually receive. You know, there's shipping income, there's taxes, just like Jeff mentioned. And so then, of course, there's all the expenses tied to it, too. And so why this matters 
is that if you just record that $83,000 number there, you're really not telling the full story on your financials. And financials are really important because they do tell the story of your business. They tell the, the history of sales and the trends of sales. They tell the seasonality of sales. They also tell us, hey, are individual line item fees going up or down? What's going on with that? They'll tell us you know, what's happening with our gross margins, what's happening with our net margins, what's happening with you know, our advertising strategy. So painting the picture together, once we have monthly P&Ls broken broken down correctly, it's like we can then start comparing different time periods, looking at where everything's going to get a much more complete and full understanding on what the business is doing rather than just one number. So it gives us more of a deep dive into what's going on. And Jeff, I don't know if you have, if you wanted to, you know, add anything on to that as well. No, br brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> like, I mean, what you just described is so funny is, is like, it happens so often. I think, yes, accounting has been preached for quite some time, but I think just because of the, the, the perceived hassle that accrual accounting has in people's minds, like they just, they optimize for the easiest solution, but unfortunately the easiest solution in the short term tends to kind of cause the most pain in the long term. Uh, and and it's, it's one of the things that I think um, e-commerce sellers should consider from the beginning. And it goes back to something that quiet light and, and I'll just kind of I'll reference them again, Joe Valley, but I'm sure this is kind of like a part of the quiet light ethos, but like, and I've, and I've heard you all say it time and time again, is that even if you don't have plans to sell your business, or at least you don't imminently have plans to sell your business, it's important to work your way backwards from what a sale would look like and kind of build your business towards that eventual outcome and setting really solid foundations. And I think that's kind of like one of the one of, one of the value propositions of moving towards accrual because kind of in, in that spirit, it helps you set your business up for success uh, in the event of an eventual acquisition. Even if that's not your intended goal, it just sets you up for success no matter what the outcome is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a quiet line. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming. <laughs> I've heard I've heard you all say it so many times. <laughs> right. It's like yeah. Even even if you know, out, if we go outside of of selling your business, it's like this is just good as a business owner to know. Yeah. Because because even that story, even if it's not used to be told to sell your company, you can still use it to improve your company. And you know, if your goal is to pass it off to your children or you know whatever your long term goal is for the company, it's like this is still fundamentally very valuable and helpful. For you to be able to improve what you're doing for sure i'm going to take this down for a second so we can i can get back to the the q a chat box here um so actually maybe this is a good segue because you just mentioned stories but um what are the most egregious errors you've seen made in accounting do they differ between fba e-commerce SaaS, etc yeah, so the biggest things I've seen are kind of what I mentioned very early on the call is COGS being recorded on a cash basis versus a cruel basis. That's usually, if there is an issue, that's usually the biggest issue. The reason why it's the biggest issue is because it makes the biggest impact on the bottom line. And so, you know, I've seen other random things done, but we, we have methods to, to smooth out those effects. So let's say, uh, for example, like you make one huge website redesign and um, you know this was a 20 grand project in one month that you spent obviously you know website redesigns aren't done every month or every year even and so what we'll do is to actually like normalize that data we'll we'll add back at an appropriate schedule so let's say they're done every five years then we'll actually attribute that 20 grand over the course of monthly over the course of five years such that the effect from that one web website redesign a decision doesn't really negatively affect you that much. It's it's more evenly distributed. And so like from that aspect, like even if there's these, you know, purchases made or these decisions made that may be one-time expenses, we can go through what we call the add back process. The add back process is basically, hey, any one-time expenses, any owner benefits, such as whatever you may pay yourself in salary. A lot of people uh, do like auto deductions or auto leases and we'll take that out of the business. 
or write off their own travel or meals or things like that. And so good news is like at the end of the day, even if we do see these things in on the books on the PL, from a valuation perspective, we're still adding back what we call owner benefits and these, these one-time additional expenses back to the bottom line so that they're not affecting valuation because at the end of the day, you shouldn't be penalized for paying yourself for you know these, these kind of things that we as owners take out of the business. Um, because at the end of the day, it's 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 your profit. You you decide what you want to do with it. So if you're going to throw it into inventory for future growth, if you're going to go spend it on a trip and write that off. Um, so the IRS may have it, you know, some words with you, but, you know, from, from an accounting perspective, it's like, we, good news is like, you know, we, we have ways to adjust for that so that we're actually only evaluating the business off really the fundamentals of, of what's going on inside the company. So good news is, yeah, if there are random or weird things going on, we can kind of figure out such that it doesn't really affect you too much. But um, as far as far as weird, I've seen some like weird expenses going on that probably should have been completely personal, but weren't, um, <laughs> you know, um, so some people travel a ton. Um, so there's just, it's funny what like some certain line items are, but at the end of the day, it's like a lot of, a lot of books look the same because there are generally accepted accounting practices and principles such that, you know, a lot of bookkeepers work in the same way. A lot of CPAs work in the same way. So yes, you know, I, every p is going to be a little bit nuanced here and there, but um, from, from the big picture aspects, it's like all of them have sales and then COGS and then gross profit and then operating expenses and then your net profit. And then we'll add things back and, and put that as SDE. So uh, Sam, I know, I know QuietLight has a really good article uh, in regards to add backs that goes into much further detail than I just went over because there's, there's, a, it's, there's a bunch of different categories like credit card rewards is another category that we can add back. So um, can we provide those in the notes that we send out after this? Because that way, I think that'll help people out a lot in figuring out, okay, what's an ad back? Is this an ad back? Is this not an ad back? Because I know that goes in a lot further detail. We could probably spend 30 minutes on ad backs if we really wanted to. Yes. Okay. Everyone clear your schedule. We're going to go over 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, we will be sending out the recording of this to everyone and we will absolutely include some articles um, on ad okay, backs cool. um, for sure. Um, and Jeff, from your perspective, I will. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I just know I had a question for Ethan. So, so addbacks are important, right? In, in the valuation of a business, it's discretionary income plus addbacks. Yeah. So essentially, our our equation for SDE, which we call sellers' discretionary earnings, is going to be the bottom line net profit that we see at the end of a PNL plus the addbacks. So, so yeah, exactly what you said. It's basically the bottom line plus add backs equals that SDE. And that SDE is what we use on the valuation side for a business. And then where does it, you talked about COGS and you talked about inventory. Where does inventory play into that from a valuation standpoint? Yeah, great question. And so that that's shown basically on the balance sheet. Balance sheets aren't talked a ton about in regards to physical product e-com world. Um, it, the, the, the most it comes up is normally when we're dealing with inventory. And so the way businesses are valued in this world is that we'll have a value for the business and then inventory is added on top of that valuation. And so inventory by the buyer is paid um, for the, or at cost. So basically at, at the seller's landed cost of goods sold, assuming that all that inventory is good, sellable, moving, usable inventory. And so from a perspective of, hey, do I have too much, too little inventory? Now that does, you know, this, this you know, of course goes back to our cash flow conversation and, and um, does depend on lead times. You know, an average lead time from manufacturing over in China right now is usually most sellers I'm seeing are around three to four month time period. So mm -hmm. that means when a buyer is buying a business right now, they, they definitely want above a typical lead time period worth of inventory because if, if you don't and they reorder, they're going to run out of stock because there's, there's less than a full lead time of inventory. So typically like buyers right now want around six-ish months of, of inventory, um, if not a little bit more because of what's been going on in the shipping side. Now, if your inventory lead time, let's say is in the US and it's, it's two weeks, then six plus months of inventory may be entirely way too much. So it really depends on, on the lead time principle of, of what you have going on. But that's where inventory plays into. So it's not, it's not a PL item. It's more of a balance sheet item. And that's how buyers are approaching, hey, how much is too much inventory versus too little inventory? Because if we start talking about too much inventory, 
then you know buyers may not want to buy it all or buy it on consignment. So it, it leads us down a different a different rabbit hole if we do have too much or stuff that's not moving. But that's that's typically how exactly that's handled between a P and L and, and balance sheet perspective. Got it. Cool. Thank you. And Jeff, just from your perspective, from the the types of clients that are coming to you at ATX. Uh, A2X, excuse me, are, are they making uh, similar mistakes or are you seeing um, similar Cogs errors? Is huge. Cogs, uh, as Ethan mentioned, is huge. And I, I kind of mentioned this previously, but if you're doing cash accounting and um, you're just recording kind of the, the payouts as income and you're not breaking out each of those transactions, we see a lot of uh, businesses either under or over reporting their profits. Um, and then in addition to that, like a little bit smaller, but also as an impact, like things like reporting uh, taxes as revenue, because, you know, in that breakdown, you saw that uh, uh, taxes was was kind of in the green and contributed to the payout. So, but COGS is really probably the biggest area of opportunity. Um, but again, as Ethan mentioned, it's something that you can't come back from, but it's definitely something that you want to consider going forward. Great. Um, we have another Q&A question from um, the audience, so I will read that to you now. Uh, is there a difference between what an aggregator is looking for in accounting or financials versus an individual buyer? Do they analyze financials the same way? Yeah, so most, uh, <laughs> if, uh, if you're growing and an aggregator catches you on a cash basis, um, they're probably not going to tell you. So, so, <laughs> at least, at least in my experience. So, um, <laughs> and why, so, why is that important? Why is that important? Because uh, going back to like where we were <laughs> talking in the beginning of this conversation is that typically for a growing e-com physical product company, if your PL is on a cash basis, your, your SDE at the end of the day is going to be lower, leading to a lower valuation. And so as far as, as what the standard is, the standard is accrual, especially for sales, and especially for COGS. Now, um, you could accruelize everything on the PL, but most time operating expenses for e-com companies, the cash and accrual are pretty much pretty similar. Like if you're paying your employees or VAs, you know, every two weeks, it's like, yeah, it's not gonna be perfect accrual, but it's gonna be pretty dang close. And so um, good news is like, you just really wanna focus on the sales. So that goes back to the slide that we pulled up and that Jeff was talking about. And so that'll show you the reason why sales are important and then to the cogs, to, to the points we previously mentioned. So um, that's kind of the, the standard. And so, um, Everyone will, whether they tell you or not, if, you're, if your P&L is not on a, on, on a accrual basis, they will change it over themselves, whether they're plugging into Amazon to do that, whether they're just asking you for certain information so they can do that on their own. An aggregator or individual buyer, at least a sophisticated individual buyer that knows these kind of things, will do that on their own, even if it's not presented that way. So the good news is, if you do it yourself and present it that way, you actually know, hey, what, what's fair in, in this transaction, you know, because you're, you're basically approaching the negotiations from the same, the same standpoint, the same fundamentals, the same information. So yes, to answer the question is that both aggregators and individual buyers expect P&Ls to be on an accrual basis. If they're not, they're going to do it themselves and they may not tell you what they're doing. No one likes a secret p &L. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. It's a, it's a really good question, though. And I think the answer is incredibly important as well. Um, well, I know um, we have about 15 more minutes. So for those of you who are tuning in, if you have any other questions, thank you for those two questions so far. Um, please feel free to, to enter them into that Q&A chat box. Um, I know we talked a little bit about how we all have some stories of, of acquisitions or maybe other things that did not go so great due to financials or accounting was one of the reasons that was, um, you know, a complication in a sale. And I know Jeff, part of my intro for you was that, so I don't know if you want to share some of that story just to give people an example of how this comes into play in a real life scenario. Yeah, it's so, so it's, it's more particular to SaaS software as a service. Um, but at field chat, the company that I, that I co-founded and joined as head of marketing, um, we raised about $1.2 million in funding and we, um, so we're a venture back business and we are growing, we're growing relatively well. I, I'd say like we're at anywhere between 30 to 50,000 in MRR monthly recurring revenue. So we're not selling physical goods and one-time purchases. It's recurring over, you know, a lifetime of potentially three years. 
Um, and we were eventually acquired for around $50 million. So like a really, a really nice outcome in a relatively short amount of time. And uh, letter of intent signed, um, going through the due, due diligence process. And then the day that we were meant to close and just transfer over and, and get absorbed into the larger organization, um, a, a really important financial metric was, I, it, it's not that it wasn't reported, it's is, is that it was misunderstood and that was our cost to serve. So how much it cost the business um, to support a customer. And then by extension, what were our profit margins uh, based on the revenue that we were bringing in per customers. And because uh, it was misunderstood and our financials weren't clear enough. And I think that like, it's quite analogous with, you know, accrual versus cash accounting. Um, and like in, in, in for e-commerce businesses, giving somebody like full visibility over a business, we didn't provide the, the buyer with full visibility. The deal actually fell through. Um, and uh, it, it just so happened that the person who is acquiring us was also a partner and then eventually built our product. Uh, so and started to sell it and moved us out of the market. So, uh, you know, really solid financial reporting and then just being able to like clearly understand how your business is operating is incredibly essential in, 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 in the, the selling process. And, you know, I, I learned firsthand how, uh, just how important that can be and why I'm a huge advocate for accrual and e-commerce uh, because I think it provides the level of visibility that that we it, it, it wasn't a question of cash versus accrual it was a question of visibility but if you look at accrual like that's it's all about visibility and it helps you um sorry what what what, what do you call it S S-T-E? S-T-E, yeah seller's S -T -E. discretionary earnings yeah yeah so so so, so or, or, or valuation right like it, it Helps improve your evaluation, but also it it, it uh, creates an environment in which there aren't any surprises. Um, I heard a, an interesting story. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna I've talked about Joe so many times, but he he had mentioned that there was a gentleman who was looking to sell his business and had two offers, um, and that gentleman did his accounting on on kind of like the back of a napkin and in an Excel spreadsheet, and the numbers were right right at the end of the day. But uh, the deals ended up falling through because the, the buyers kind of didn't necessarily have confidence in the numbers, even though they were right because of how they were presented. And uh, after kind of like going back to the accrual model and, and getting an outsourced bookkeeper to support them with, um, with you know, providing that full visibility, uh, it, it actually got them to eventually sell the business, but moreover, increase the valuation by like $50,000. So um, you know, like in our case, it was a, it was, you know, a failing of, of providing solid financial visibility and, and what our profit margins were on, on each customer. Uh, and then the, in, in Joe's case, it's, it was less about kind of the numbers being accurate and more about how they were being presented and the level of confidence that that gave the buyer. Um, so like another thing that we don't talk about with accrual accounting, like we're talking about like all the great benefits, but it makes you seem like a real business when, when somebody is coming and knocking at your door and purchasing it makes the assets seem more valuable. Uh, I, I, I know I might be speaking out of turn, uh, Ethan, but I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to hear your perspective on that. No, yeah, no, that was fantastic. I appreciate you telling us that story. I know, <laughs> I know it's, not, it's not easy to go through that experience. Like yeah. if, if, if a deal falls through, it's, uh, it's, it's gut-wrenching. So um, no, I, I appreciate you going through that. Um, but yeah, to kind of add on to that, if, if you're sitting here and not knowing if you're on a cash or accrual basis accounting right now, you're probably on cash basis, but a super easy way to tell and kind of like a little, a little secret is that if you take your, your gross profit, which is essentially your sales minus COGS, and you divide that over your sales and you do this monthly. So, you know, we'll do this for March, February, January, and kind of keep going back. You'll, you'll get a percentage. And for physical product e percentages, typically it's 50 to 65%. Um, sometimes they get as high as 80, sometimes they'll drop a little into the 40s, but typically it's, it's right around that range. And if that, if that number is consistent from month to month, good news is if you're on a accrual basis or your cash basis is steady enough with your purchasing where it almost looks like a accrual basis. If it's going up from negative 10 to 100 to 17 to 35, if it's jumping all over the place and jumping between negative and positive and just these really large fluctuations that are more than probably like a 10, 20 point spread, then that means you're probably on a cash basis. And so like, I know in like in my own example, it's like, 
I was working with, with a seller recently and we were going over their books. They thought their books were on accrual basis, um, kind of went over big picture overview on the valuation call. Cool. By the end of the day, you know, their, their business was worth a few hundred thousand dollars. I, I got a hold of the actual financials use, using that exact trick that I just told you, realize like, hey, your books are not actually on accrual, they're on cash basis. Let's convert these. So we did, ended up changing a ton. Their business is now a million bucks plus. Mm. And so they were, they were extremely happy having that call going from, oh, a few hundred thousand to now, to now a million. So, you know, it was a, it was a multiple factor increase just based off of just, just a little accounting trick. That's awesome. That's the call you want to be able to make. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt, I felt good. <laughs> um, and I, I just want to touch on something that I think both of you sort of spoke to, and especially you, Jeff, that, and it's come up in a, a couple of different conversations, um, that I've had in these webinars is that you don't have to necessarily tell like the most perfect, beautiful picture, but it needs to be correct and clear and honest. And that's what people really care about. And that goes a huge way for buyers. They don't care just about um, the end number. It's also the process and the relationship and that honesty and open candor and, you know, is so important. So I think I just wanted to um, reiterate that, that both of you guys spoke to. It's like, just being very clear is important, not just, you know, perfect. 100%. Definitely. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, going back to, to the sales, it, it, it's a relationship between a buyer and a seller. And so if, if I'm not saying you did this, Jeff, but, you know, if, if any distrust embezzles as far as is part of that process or something pops up that was mis misaligned expectations, you know, it hurts that relationship. It hurts that trust, which can hurt, hurt, hurt the deal make the deal fall through. So um, just from the sense of, hey, our books are as accurate as we know, you know, you know, you're presenting information truthfully and accurately. It really helps, you know, take the ball really far down the field in essence of, of getting really close to being able to close a deal just, just from that one standpoint alone. So I don't think that that point is talked about enough, but that helps just build trust and credibility, just having good and solid books there. So it's like, that's a, you know, more of an emotional, personal element as far as part of the transaction, but it's, it's extremely important. Huge. All about intent and perception, right? Like you can, mm -hmm. you can have the right intent, but if, you know, it's not reflected in the numbers or in the books, the perception on the, on the other side could be, uh, could be, could be damaged a little bit. So right. yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's where relying on experts can be super helpful. Like if you're, if you're like Ethan and you love math and you're really good at it and it's, it's your bread and butter, then great by all means. And if it's not, um, find people who it is that for them so that, you know, you don't, um, end up in a situation where you unfortunately lose, um, at the, the last minute at the finish line to go back to the running analogy, um, from earlier, uh, or my Apple watch is going to tell me to stand up to <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll tell me to go check my accruals. <laughs> When um, Ethan was doing this simple calculation, I was there with like a piece of paper and a pen. I was like, what is simple? <laughs> <laughs> simple to you. It might not be simple to everybody else. I know. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, I think, is there anything else that you guys want to touch on while we have a few extra minutes? Um, otherwise, we can tell everyone how to reach out to both of you um, and, and close out. I mean, as far as is, I know we talked about implementing kind of this practice, systemizing it, outsourcing it. Um, Jeff, I wanted I wanted to ask you a quick question on the A2X. Remember that slide that we were talking about? Uh, does A2X handle taking all of that information and splitting it out to the appropriate software that you know if someone's using QuickBooks Zero, anything like that? Yes, so we do. So um, those those deposits that you see from Amazon or really any other sales channel um, will transform them into summaries that are broken out into each of those individual transactions that, that I showed, and then um, and then tie them back to the deposit on your general ledger. So if you're using like a Zero or QuickBooks Online, you'll see the deposit on the the left side of your screen, which is you know uh, the the recording of the the bank transactions, and then the corresponding attached transaction is going to be like a neatly organized summary of each of those individual transactions that you can just reconcile. They totally match and then they show up on your PL. So instead of just kind of like having, you know, that deposit recorded as income, it's now kind of like broken out into like, what are the fees, what are the taxes, what, so on and so forth. So definitely that's where A2X comes into play. And then where um, our expert bookkeepers come into play, if you do decide to outsource and transition away from cash into accrual, 
like they really know how to how, how to wield the technology, uh, connect all of the, the 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 different endpoints, and ensure that you have kind of like an incredibly automated process. And then they provide you with the reports that uh, Ethan, you mentioned earlier that like you really like to dig into and and provide that kind of like financial analysis there. So um, that's that's where A2X comes into play, but. You know, you could check out a2xaccounting.com and, and learn more. But beyond that, I just want to say thanks so much to uh, Sam and, and to, to Ethan for putting together this webinar. I'd say, like, Ethan, I, I learned a ton throughout this. Oh, this sweet. Hour. So uh, it's really, it's really great to, to kind of hear about um, kind of the power of accounting through a seller who's kind of done this with an incredible amount of success over the last few years. So thank you for that. Cool. And kind of add, to add to what Jeff was saying, just to give um, inside perspective of, of what I see, you know, a lot of sellers in the market doing is that uh, a lot of people are using some sort of automated software like A2X to pull those transactions out and push to whatever accounting software that they use. Most is QuickBooks followed by zero. And so um, from that, you know, whether they have bookkeeper or the, they themselves like categorize that or automate that through through rules, um, you know, I'll, I'll see different methods as far as what to do with the data once it's actually uh, broken down to the correct forms. But that's that's from my side what I'm seeing a lot of sellers do just to give everyone kind of a inside of, of, you know, hey, what's everyone else doing? So that's that's what I'll see a lot of the time. Nice. And everyone loves time back in their day. And what better way to do that than <laughs> automate all the math? Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you both so much for joining. Jeff, if people want to reach out to you directly, how can they do that? Uh, Jeff at a2xaccounting.com. Um, Jeff is G-E-O-F-F -F, um, and uh, A2X is accounting. We all know how to spell those things. Uh, unfortunately, Jeff, I, I have the weird, I have the weird spelling. <laughs> <laughs> unique. Unique. <laughs> Uh, and um, Ethan, how can folks reach out to you? Yeah, I'm Ethan at quietlight.com. That's E-T-H-A-N and then quietlight.com. Great. I love a good name at and, and you know, <laughs> nice, and easy. nice and easy, hopefully. Cool. Well, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. We will be sending out this recording along with a bunch of other resources and um, uh, re reiterating how you can reach out to both Jeff and Ethan. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, everyone. Sweet. Thanks, guys.